It has been said many times before that there is no such thing as a dull moment for those around the Dallas Cowboys. Certainly a statement that reigns true yet again in year number 63 for the franchise. Hello everybody. I'm Kyle Yeomans taking a look back, taking you through the 2022 season for America's team. And to start, there's really only one word, only one that could accurately describe the 2022 season for the Cowboys. That word is resilience. Ironically, it's the same word that Mike McCarthy and his coaching staff used during training camp in July as a rally cry, where in Oxnard, California, they prepared for the season ahead, a season that was nearly over before it even started with questions surrounding personnel, coaching decisions, injuries, and expectations. Yet somehow, as the year went along, the goals remained the same and were completely within reach. A playoff berth, strengths in each element of the game, and a chance to fight for it all still on the table. However, just like in 2021, certain obstacles and miscues prevented the Cowboys from reaching the ultimate prize, leading to more departures and more questions. But before we can address the future, we must take a look back at what was a 2022 season full of challenges and resilience. In a few moments, I'll be joined by three former Cowboys, Barry Church, Isaiah Stanback, and Nate Newton, along with team reporter Haley Sutton. So we examine every single inch of what the 2022 season was for the Dallas Cowboys, starting with an unlikely hero. How did Cooper Rush help save the season at his five games at quarterback? And how did the team improve because of it? We start with week one when we come back. The 2022 Dallas Cowboys year end special presented by Miller Lite is brought to you by Dr. Pepper, the one you deserve, an official soft drink of the Dallas Cowboys, Ford F-Series, the best selling truck in Texas, and by Miller Lite, the only beer of the Dallas Cowboys. It's Miller time. This segment is brought to you by Ford F-Series, the best-selling truck in Texas. First and 10 tie game, fourth quarter. Swatter, make sure in the air, we take it. We're going to take it. Pollard motion, circles back left, rush with a play fake to Elliott, throws a deep ball to the left side, land 15-10. Oh! Bulls his way to the one-yard line. Oh! Not dropping that one. I saw it. Remember that other one? That I dropped, not dropping this one. Elliott to the left of Rush, first and goal outside the one. Snap back, Rush looking left. Fade, okay. left. Oh, caught in one hand. Touchdown, Cowboys. That's all I have to say. Wipe his nose. Wipe his nose. Wipe his nose. <laughs> The first six games of the 2022 season were a whirlwind for the Dallas Cowboys that included a roller coaster ride. The ups and the downs came early and often for Dallas, and it started with quite the downturn in week number one against the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. As we welcome in Isaiah Stanback, Super Bowl champion, we've got Barry Church, former Cowboys safety. I'm Kyle Yeoman, so let's take a look back all the way back to the start, week one against the Buccaneers. 19 to 3 was the final score, and Things didn't go well for the Cowboys. Yes, they were down 19 to 3. Dak Prescott injured on the final drive, out with a fractured thumb for the next five weeks. Things looked dim for the Cowboys, but why were things so dysfunctional in week one? It, it made you have almost a little bit of PTSD. And the reason why I say that is because you couldn't get things going, mm -hmm. right? You couldn't get things going. Nothing was grabbing. Offensively, you looked terrible. Defensively, you couldn't stop the run, At all. right? So it felt very <laughs> much so like it like it ended up last year against San Francisco in the playoffs. And I think that's why it looked so. It, it felt so dim. Um, it, it, at the conclusion of that game. Uh, Dak really couldn't get things going. You felt like the, the offense was dysfunctional in terms of what Kellen Moore was trying to initiate offensively. Mm -hmm. The running game was actually going really well. And, and that's one thing that we struggle with with, with Kellen Moore in the past is, you know, we had a running game, but then he wants to get away from it. 
And I think there was a lot of frustrations in regards to that. Yeah, it was a frustrating game plan overall. When you talk about everything, offensively, defensively, you know, when you look at our offense, it was stuck in neutral. You know, they couldn't really run the football. Dak was inefficient out there. I think he went 14 for 29, maybe 134 yards, but he also had that one interception out there. And when you talk about the game plan as far as running the football, that's what was so frustrating to me. I understand defense, we couldn't really stop the run for net, you know, went for 121 yards, but offensively, it was still a tight game. And to go away from the run, because Ezekiel Elliott at the time, he was averaging, 5. what, 5.5 5. 5 yards per carry. And for those who don't know, that's a lot of yards <laughs> to average. So I think they gave up on the run too early because combined, Ezekiel Elliott and Tony Pollard had 12 carries. And so that, that's just not going to get the job done. So to me, overall, offensively it was frustrating, but the game plan was what really kind of got on my nerves. And plenty of fans after the loss, 19-3, to were looking at this game and saying, the season's over, let's wrap it up and try it again in 2023. <laughs> But if this one taught anything, if this season taught us anything, it's not to rush to conclusions. Ooh, and with like more on that, is. we welcome in Haley Sutton. Cooper Rush was never meant to be the starting quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. But when Dak Prescott went down, many wavered, but Cooper Rush did not. When his name was called, he answered and kept the season alive for America's team. And the Cowboys will have to do it without Dak Prescott out with a broken thumb. Cooper Rush going to get his second career start. You know, let's be honest, you all weren't very excited about us at week one, you know. So um, I think that, you know, we grew into the team that we were close to being where we wanted to be. When Rush took the field against Cincinnati during week two, there was no drop off. A game winning drive orchestrated by the new QB1 led to the Cowboys taking down Burrow. Cowboys win it. Jones, Wentz. Throws deep. And even the reigning Super Bowl champions. Uh, yeah, it's just a job. You know, it's easy right now with us playing defense the way we are and uh, running the ball and makes QB um, a lot easier. And then uh, just trusting in, you know, you've ran this offense for years, so you just kind of stick to the plan and it's working out. Even with Dak Prescott's return looming, Rush never lost sight of the goal to keep this team going. You know, we had a Rough first outing against Tampa. Cooper coming in there and, you know, we're able to win games and continue to continue to get better and, you know, on defense and, you know, keep, keep, you know, growing with the young guys. In his final game as a starter, Rush finished with a deflating loss to NFC East rival Philadelphia. While statistically it was the worst game of his short career as a starter, the impact he left on the season was so much bigger than one game's performance. It's meant a lot. He went out there and did everything that I expected Coop to do. Just knowing that the way he prepares, the way that he goes, that he approaches each and every day, um, how mentally tough he is and uh, how mentally sharp he is, I knew that he was going to go out there and, and put our, our team in a chance to a position to, to do it exactly what they did. So, um, and, and the rest of the guys just rallying around him, understanding that everybody just had to, you know what I mean, raise their level. And uh, at this point, everybody's going to continue to raise their level, and that's what he's done. And. That's what this team's done, and uh, it's exciting that we're in this position. Uh, and we can, uh, I can come back and we can roll it. Long story short, Cooper Rush saved the season. You just stay who you are um, within yourself. You kind of realize it is just football again. You know, it's just at a bigger stage, better players, but you're playing with better players. You know, you can freak yourself out about things, but you know, once you're in it, it's just ball again, and it's kind of what you're meant to do. Cooper Rush finished the season with 1,051 yards and five touchdowns. He's now one of 20 players up for a new contract here in Dallas. And while we don't know what the future holds for Cooper Rush, we do know this. He helped keep the season alive for the Dallas Cowboys. Here in the studio, I'm Haley Sutton. I'll send it back over to you guys. Thank you very much, Haley. And Cooper Rush saga was certainly just like that. Four and one in between, in between weeks two and six. And it was a phenomenal run for the backup quarterback for the Cowboys. Now, Barry, I'll start with you. Just how crucial was Cooper Rush during those weeks in order to come out on top? I'll say it was crucial. He wasn't the most important factor in how they went with this five-game stretch without Dak Prescott, but he was extremely important as far as helping this team get over the hump um, without their quarterback one. If you look at it, I love the part that he he kind of just stayed within himself. You know, he didn't try to be somebody he wasn't. He understood that he had a great formula going, which is leaning on that ground game. You got two studs in the backfield, and then you also got an unbelievable defense out there. And if you can lean on those two things without messing up, kind of being a, a game manager out there, then you can go out there and get W's. And he was exactly exactly that out there but what impressed me the most about his game 
was outside of that Eagles game, outside of the last one, he didn't turn the football over. He did not turn the football over not once. He kept the ball out of harm's way and let that defense in that run game do what they do best. And to me, he should hold his head high because he was definitely a help in making sure they got 4-1 after that uh, five-game stretch. You know what happens if a, if a ship goes down at sea? You know, even if it just stops out there, <laughs> what they grab a tugboat. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and, and Cooper Rush was a doggone tugboat. Yeah. He locked up to that thing. He brought. He just continued to get those guys going. Yeah. And that's all that you really asked for. You wanted a guy that was going to be consistent, that you could be tried and true. He knows the system. And the, what you just touched on, he makes good decisions. Yes. He made good decisions, and he wasn't going to the C.D. Lambs and the guys that everybody was hoping for. Who did he find? Noah Brown. Yep. He went to the guy that he was most comfortable with, and that's what worked for him, and that's what worked for this offense. He continued to make those good decisions, and they continued to trust the ground game and put him in situations, much like a San Francisco did with Purdy, to be successful, and that's ultimately what happened. Who knew that we were going to have a marine talk in the middle <laughs> of our year-in review here as we continue to look ahead uh, to that 2022 season for the Dallas Cowboys. Cooper Rush helped save the season, but how did Tony Pollard help elevate it? We'll talk about that when we come back. This segment was brought to you by Ford F-Series, the best-selling truck in Texas. To the 18 of Chicago, I formation behind him. Hand off Pollard, stars the hole on the left side, 10. That's right, five. Walk the dog, you Tony Pollard. Walk that dog. A third of the way through the season for the Dallas Cowboys feeling pretty good at four and two just in time for their quarterback to return. Dak Prescott makes his return just in front of four straight matchups with the NFC North as we welcome in Nate Newton for the first time into the show. Six time Pro Bowler and three time Super Bowl champ. We're back here with Isaiah Stanback as well. Let's start with the Detroit Lions. The fighting Dan Campbell's and company came to AT&T Stadium. Dak didn't have to do a whole lot. Just 200 yards in his return. Ezekiel Elliott got hurt. That was a little shaky for the Cowboys, but the defense forces five takeaways in that win and able to overcome some of the early energy from the Lions. Yeah, the, the Lions came out fighting. We just talked about the fighting Cam uh, Dan Campbell's. Those guys, one thing you know about them, they have a character, they have an identity, and their identity is come hit you in the mouth, and that's exactly what they did. They busted Dallas in the mouth initially. They put Zeke out the game, hit him in his kneecap, flipped him upside down. They did all those things. But the good thing about this is, Nate, you found out that your team was going to step it up. They responded. They didn't back down. They puffed their puffed the chest up, and they said, all right, let's go blow to blow. And D-Law got him with a uh, down on the one. He uh, knocked him for a loss, and I can't stop laughing. But I tell you, like this right here, these guys kept playing. Then they got the fight Dan Campbell's in the end. <laughs> they got him in the end, and yeah. that was the biggest thing was Zeke got hurt, and that kind of lasted a little bit longer. But I think the resilience that the Cowboys showed in that game was what Mike McCarthy had been wanting to see from his program. Now let's fast forward to Chicago, and this was just a ground attack on both sides. Chicago ran for over 200 yards. The run defense really struggled, but Tony Pollard, without Ezekiel Elliott, began to shine. 14 carries, 131 yards, and three touchdowns in his first game without Zeke. What did we learn about Tony Pollard in this offense and what he could do to elevate it? You, I think this is the first game that you knew that Tony Pollard could be your main back. And I think that was the, 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 the big coming out moment for, for Tony Pollard. He understood what was on the table for him. He understood the situation. He knew, understood the opportunity. And he took full advantage. The offensive line did a great job blocking it up for him. And then what did he do? He used exactly the skill set that he had and was able to burst through that first line, second line. And once he gets through that, you're not catching him. You know, I like how they used him this game. They got him outside. They got him inside. They, they tossed him a few balls. He was very efficient with his running because he had 14 carries for a lot of yards. And they stuck with him. And they used him in the right ways, man. So that's the first time we've ever seen him just take the team and put it on his back you know, in, in a powerful way. So two straight games against the NFC North. Then you take a little bit of a break and then come back. And it's uh, Green Bay. It's the return for Mike McCarthy to his former stomping grounds to take on the Packers. 14 points up in the second half. And the Cowboys fall to Aaron Rodgers. Christian Watson, the rookie wide receiver out of North Dakota State. He ends up with three touchdowns. What went wrong in Green Bay, and, and why was that a concern for the Cowboys? Oh, well, you just you went against his guy, John Wick. You know what I mean? Aaron <laughs> Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers is who he is. But you you they they attacked the weak spot of Dallas's defense, and that's what was what was what 
defensive yeah. line. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, they went to the ground and pound you know, with, with their two-headed monster, Aaron Jones and Dylan. Those guys were just too efficient for this Dallas front. Um, and you talked about Watson. Those guys, they just stayed persistent throwing the ball in the air. He missed a lot of opportunities, but they kept going back to him because that was their main guy. 207 yards rushing. They they refused to quit running. They saw what uh, what Detroit could have done, and they saw what the Bears did do. And they did, and we did, and we did not uh, bolster our defensive line to make sure that that didn't happen. And that's how they got back into that game. You don't let John Wicks. You got to stomp him out. And that's Aaron Rodgers. And that was really a benchmark game for the Cowboys, knowing that they had lost a couple early ones, but that one you felt like you should have had on the road at Lambeau Field. It did not go your way. So the Cowboys were a little angry about it, specifically talking about Micah Parsons. That defense felt like they were wronged in that loss against Green Bay. How did they respond and how did the defense grow from that moment when we come back with more resilience to the 2022 Dallas Cowboys season? We gotta let this burn. We gotta let this burn. We got to put these in the fire with it. Point blank period. Ain't no other way. We don't lead this without a dub. Point blank period. At the 32 yard line, third down and three. Come on, Micah. Stop for it. Third down, we need to stop. Third down, sure Cousins back. No rush. Now flushed by Parsons. Caught by Parsons. And sacked and fumbled. I set that off. Hey, what the f- you talking about, baby? I told you. Hey, keep going. You said, hey, he going to build mind now. Welcome back in as we continue to take a look back at the 2022 season for the Dallas Cowboys. Resilience from the star in Frisco. We've got Barry Church, Nate Newton. I'm Kyle Yeomans. Now, let's take a look at one of the best games of the year for the Dallas Cowboys. Some thought it was the peak for the Cowboys. 40 to 3 on the road in Minnesota against at that point what was a one loss Vikings team that came into that one 8 and 1. Was this the best version of the Cowboys we saw all year? Without a doubt. I think this was the most complete version of this team. When you talk about all three phases being dominant, offensively, defensively, and special teams, they all came to the table to play. When you talk about the offense, I believe Dak was extremely efficient out there. I think he only missed three passes, 276 yards, two touchdowns. So he was cool, calm, and collected throughout the entire game. Zeke and Pollard combined for 122 yards out there in the defense. They played phenomenal. I mean, they made life hard for Kirk Cousins the entire afternoon. I think they sacked him seven times but to me the story about this game it was a breakout game for Tony Pollard when you talk about it I think he showed the world how explosive he can be he had 80 yards on the ground but he also had six receptions for 109 yards and two touchdowns so he showed that he wasn't just a change of pace back out there he can handle the load of being a supreme back as well as being an explosive home run threat it was a big showing for uh, Tony Pollard you cannot have told me after they beat Buffalo they, they found a way to beat Buffalo, but we whooped them. We was on our way. We was going to be consistent. It wasn't going to be no resilience. That word wouldn't have showed up. We were just <laughs> going to beat team after team after team. But, hey, it didn't happen, but that was a great victory. That was a super victory. Yeah, a lot of people were on a high pedestal at that point, knowing that this team had just knocked off a team of that caliber. And in that scenario, a lot of people were buying in on the Cowboys. Now, they, they did back that up with a couple more wins after that. Thanksgiving against the Giants, 28-20, to 20, which included possibly the best celebration of the season. The tight ends jumping into the Salvation Army yes. kettle and doing a little whack of tight end. Those tight ends stepped up, some of the young guys especially, Nate. How big was that for the offense? That was big because I thought that was just going to add on to what we had done the previous week. I thought that with our tight ends doing what they need to do and Dak finding not one tight end but just three tight ends doing what he what he had to do but what was more more important there was we beat two I think good coordinators the head coach and coach Dable being a good offensive man and then coach Wink Martindale being a great defensive man I I knew we was there then with our offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator and then after that game happened there was a, a long week a little bit of time off for the Cowboys and then they played on Sunday night football against Indianapolis a game where they scored 33 points in the fourth quarter alone it was a little shaky to start but then you get up and you put up a 50 burger on Sunday night football how impressive was that win and 
what they were able to do late. I believe it was extremely impressive because when you look at it, it was once again one of those games where the Cowboys kind of played down to the level of their competition early on. It was a close game all the way up into the fourth quarter. I think yeah. it was 21 to 19. And then you just saw an onslaught of defensive pressure and scores out there. I mean, a defensive line got after Matt Ryan out there, stripped him a couple times. You saw defensive touchdowns as well, but 33 points in a fourth quarter. I mean, that's unheard of. I mean, that's just remarkable, but hat goes off to that team, man. They had a heck of a game plan. It was a phenomenal game plan to down Jeff Saturday and the Indianapolis Colts in that one, and it was three straight wins for the Cowboys, starting to figure things out and keep rolling. They had some hopes for the division still in place. However, how was this win streak halted? Well, it was halted by a big-time comeback. We'll talk about what went wrong when we come back here on Resilience, the Cowboys 2022 season. Probably a win. At the 40 of Houston, snap back first down. Wings it deep down the right side, top. Let's go! In the gun, Prescott snap back, handoff, Elliott driving, pushing, touchdown! So following the scare against Indianapolis, things got a little dicey again against the Houston Texans in week 14 as we welcome back in Isaiah Stanback and Nate Newton trailing against the Houston Texans at that point. The NFL's worst record at home at AT&T Stadium. You were down up until the final 46 seconds of the game. A game winning touchdown drive wins it in the final minute and the Cowboys survive with 10 unanswered points in the fourth quarter. How did this show a little bit of resilience? Because this is a team that on paper the Cowboys should have put away early, but did it also show a couple red flags that might flare up a little bit later? I think it showed you more red flags than it showed you resilience, okay. to be honest with you. I know it's the name of the show, but <laughs> but the, the red flags were waving, Nate, and I think you agree with me. This is a team that you should have handily taken care of. And we all know as former players, it doesn't matter what's on paper. It doesn't matter what's on paper. You still have to show up and you got to play the game. Okay, it doesn't matter that you're playing the Texans. These guys showed up and they wanted to, they wanted to play, right? They wanted to fight a little bit, and you didn't match their intensity. And because you didn't match, your, match their intensity, you found yourself with your back against the wall. And really in a situation where you should have lost the game. And simply because they messed up at the end of the game, that's the reason why you walked away with a W. But to your point, you crept out of this one, and you crept out of one before that. This was back-to-back -back opportunities that you had. Not one quarterback, but two different quarterbacks, and both of them was inexperienced. We should have blew these guys out. We had guys getting banged up. Our defense has started to wear down. I mean, because they played excellent the first six games. Then Dak showed up, and they found out they had to play even a little bit harder to get him back rolling. So our defense was being worn down, and it took, what, two minutes in the game, a game-winning drive? Why? These guys from down south, man, they shouldn't even been up on this road. They should have turned down the trip, but instead we gave them new life. <laughs> wow. It was a it was a dual quarterback yeah, attack. Yeah. It was Jeff Driscoll along with Davis Mills that kind of kept the Cowboys off balance. And some thought that that would be the wake up call for this Cowboys team. But then you go one more week into the future and the Jacksonville Jaguars on the road. You were up by 17 points on one quarterback, but that quarterback's name was Trevor Lawrence, who started to find his stride late in the season. He founded it against the Cowboys. Why was that Jacksonville game so significant to show what this Cowboys team was made of? Uh, simply because of the fact that when you're playing against a, a Jacksonville team that had a plethora of receivers and you needed to know what your DB situation was, right? You know it wasn't what it once was, right? So you had a couple guys, a couple of your starters missing, J. Lou, right, A.B., both of those guys were missing, and now you find yourself in a situation where you have to try to guard all these guys that have a ton of weapons. And you found out that you did not have the resources that you needed at that point in time to stop that type of attack. So again, as we talk about red flags, that was something that was alert alert for Dallas. They forgot who the, who the head coach was. I mean, he's taking quarterbacks with less talent. One we thought was talented, Carson Wentz, but a, another guy he took less talented, and he got a first round pick, first player pick, who didn't have the stable uh, force that this coach is. 
this is why this kid did what he did, and their defense made the adjustments in the second half to stop us. Hey, that's the team that's on the, on, on the come up, but the Cowboys should have blew them out. Yeah, head coach Doug Peterson and company, who of course spent some time with Philadelphia and then made his way to Jacksonville this year, kind of turned that program around a little bit, and it certainly showed in that one game against the Cowboys. Now, there were some injuries that started to pile up. You mentioned it. No Jordan Lewis, no Anthony Brown at the cornerback spot. So they had to have some younger guys step up in the secondary. Who stepped up? Who stood out at the secondary level for the Cowboys? We'll talk about it as we wrap up the regular season when we come back. side of the offensive formation snap back wants to throw quickly out ball's caught Watkins wait wait a minute did Bland intercept that Bland is with the ball Bland has stolen the ball hey they gotta put you out for rookie of the year I'm gonna tweet that man DB hey, rookie of the year rookie of the year rookie of the year first and ten from the 25 Gives it to Sanders. Hold Fumble on. the ball! It's rolling loose. Oh, horrible things are happening on the ground there at the bottom of that pile. And the Cowboys have recovered a fumble. It's time to wrap up the regular season and then look ahead to what the Cowboys did in the playoffs as we're back with Isaiah and Barry. I'm Kyle Yeomans. Now, let's start with the three straight games against backup quarterbacks. I mean, what kind of luck could you get for the Cowboys? They faced Gardner Minshew in week 16 against the Philadelphia Eagles, a win against their divisional rival that actually kept their hopes for a number one seed alive. Yeah, they took care of business against them, but you expected them to um, as they were kind of starting to sit some guys in preparation for the playoffs. Um, but ultimately, it's a W. It doesn't really matter how you go about it. You get a W in the NFC, uh, you know, in, uh, NFC East, and that's all that really mattered. Yeah, I think this game kind of showed how resilient a quarterback Dak Prescott can be. Because if you look at the week be before, he threw two interceptions, one being the game winner in overtime against the Jacksonville Jaguars. That was a bad loss. They should have beaten that team. But then you go against the Eagles, and you throw an interception your very first drive out there. A lot of guys would have folded and caved in and called a wrap. But uh, Dak Prescott was able to bounce back and have one of his best games of the season. They got a W, so hats goes off to him. Also, not to mention, you, you talk about the defense forcing more turnovers. Those takeaways continue to add up, and that continued even into a short week against the Tennessee Titans. I mean, you go on the road on Thursday night football to face a backup quarterback <laughs> with Tennessee, and you don't have any of their guys. Malik Willis, Ryan Tannehill, not available, so you see a new quarterback there, too. What did that Thursday night game show you about the Cowboys, or was things – uh, already looking ahead to the postseason by that yeah, point. You felt like they were starting to look ahead towards the postseason. And guys really didn't show up willing to play that game to the best of their ability. They actually had to try to cut it into overdrive to try to make sure that they didn't lose that game. So um, I didn't really learn much from those guys in that particular game aside from the fact that they do not show up the same for every game. Yeah, I'm with you on this one. This should have been a blowout. You're going against a third string quarterback who got there eight days previous. No Derrick Henry, no Jeffrey Simmons, and it was still a ball game out there. A lot of drop passes by Tennessee. So to me, this was an ugly win for the Dallas Cowboys. Could you say the same thing about an ugly loss in the final game oh. of the regular season? Because Washington dismantled the Cowboys with Sam Howell at quarterback. So the third of three straight backup quarterbacks, Barry I mean, it's never easy facing somebody you don't have film on, yes. but against a team like Washington, who had really nothing to play for, you felt like you should have won that game. Yeah, they should have won this. This was the most frustrating uh, game to watch as far as the defensive standpoint because you're going against a guy, Sam Howell. This is a rookie who's never started or thrown a pass in a regular season game, and the guy looked like he belonged out there. He looked like he could be a starter out there. He was had success throwing the ball as well as running the football with two touchdowns. So, to me, this – this was all on the defense. They should have been able to corral this team, and they weren't. They played down to the level of competition. And Isaiah, you talked about it a little bit ago as well when you, you, you mentioned Dak Prescott and his throws, his interceptions. They reared their ugly head again against Washington. But hopefully that's not what would happen into the playoffs, right? Well, at least not in the wild card round. The Cowboys moved on to the wild card round to face Tampa Bay. We'll talk about how that one went and how Dak Prescott had one of the best games of his career when we come back.
Second and 15. Trips to the right. Two to the left. Prescott over the middle for Lamb, and he pulled it away. Twenty yards on second and 15. Now first down. Slam. Empty. Gallup. Empty. Empty gun. Second down, snap back. Well protected. Now he escapes out to his left. Good block, Tyler Smith. Pumps, throws it in the end zone. Caught. Touchdown. Hey, tough to stop now. Let's go. Tough to stop. Keep doing this. Just like this. Welcome back into Resilience as we continue to take a look back at the 2022 Dallas Cowboys season. Now we've got all three up here joining us. Isaiah Stanback, Barry Church. And Nate Newton, I'm Kyle Yeomans, and now we go into the playoffs. Wild card round for the second straight year. This time it's against the same team that beat you in the week one edition of this rivalry. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers led by, of course, Tom Brady. And this time went much differently in the wild card round than it did in 2021. The Cowboys taking down Tom Brady thanks to a phenomenal performance from Dak Prescott. 25 of 33 passing, over 300 yards and four touchdowns. It was a 31-14 dismantling of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers in the wild card round and on the road. What did this tell you? about Dak Prescott and where did this rank in terms of his individual performances throughout his career because it looked like it was one of his best. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and say that this is one of the best, Kyle. And the reason being, because this is the deck that everybody hopes for. Yes. Yeah, this is the deck that has a running game. He does the play action passes. He has he's highly you know, high precision in terms of his accuracy, and he just makes plays. You know, and he didn't put himself in a situation nor this offensive situation where these guys could turn the ball over. Yes. And that was the biggest differentiator for him in this particular game. No force. He didn't force not one bad play. Mm. He still has some errant throws. But it wasn't because he was trying to fit something in there or, or being aggressive. It's, it's like he took that week of preparation to say, don't let me hurt my team. And he let the strength of the team take advantage of it. And that was our defense. And when you, and when you do that right there, that, that's the Dak we knew a lot of years ago. This other Dak has been throwing the ball, forcing the ball, in no reins. Nobody's no put a, put a bit in his mouth. And he's not a horse, but, you know, I'm just going back to old country <laughs> western. You know, put a bit in his mouth and hold him back and make and make him understand that this is who you are. Let the, can't, let the game come to you. Like a great point guard who's leading his team and he shoots when he have to. A young Chris Paul, I would say. Mm. No, I don't think this was Dak's best game of his career, if I'm being honest, because if you look at the stakes that were out there, I mean, this is playoffs. Do, do, if you win, you can survive. If you lose, you're going home. And then you're going against a guy and Tom Brady, who's this organization has never beaten before. And so to me, for him to have that performance and that high of a stake, it was outstanding. I mean, the guy was extremely cool, calm, and collected. He was efficient, like you guys just mentioned out there. He didn't turn the ball over, and he got everybody involved. I think he hit eight different receivers yes. out there. So he dialed up a performance of a lifetime against a Todd Bowles defense who he has struggled in the past. So to me, this was the best game of Dak Prescott's career. And it was his second playoff win, with that being said, because overall, you look at what He's brought to the table in the regular season. The statistics have always been there. Yeah. However, the playoff success hasn't. So you go into the wild card, you get the win against Tom Brady, and now you move on and you face the same team that beat you a year ago, the San Francisco 49ers. So a little bit different this time around because now it's in the divisional round for the Cowboys versus 49ers. This didn't go well, though, for the Dallas Cowboys. Two interceptions for Dak Prescott. 49ers take down the Cowboys despite only scoring 19 points. The defense did their job, Barry, yes. but the offense didn't hold up there into the bargain. Yeah, when you talk about the defense, I feel like they did everything they could to keep this team within striking distance to win this game. I mean, you talk about putting the pressure on Purdy, who for that stretch, I mean, he was outstanding. He was getting the ball out quick. He wasn't turning the ball over. But the defense, they played outstanding. Parsons and those guys, they made life hard for him in the pocket. So defensively, they were great. Offensively, once again, these turnovers, they struck their ugly head out there. And we had two turnovers in the worst possible situations. The first pick, I think it was to the Lenore on the corner out there, put the 49ers in scoring range. Defense did a great job of holding them. And then you got to that second pick. The second pick is what is mind blowing to me. Because if you look at it, two people had an opportunity to intercept the pass. So we know it was a terrible decision on Dak Prescott's um, part right there. And it gave that 49ers the momentum to keep going. And we all knew turnovers, they were going to bite us in the butt, and they did at the worst uh, moment of the season. And, and this, this is what baffles me. And we know that the offensive quarter is not, not here anymore. We know 
that a, a bunch of guys are gone. But this is what baffled me. All year long, Isaiah has been watching Michael Gallup. And he's like, Nate, he can't come out of the, his moves. He can't do the deep comebacks. He can't stop and cut and, and, and do digs and, on his leg. Now that we know his other knee was bad and ankle bad, you throw him a route where he has to come back and fight for the ball? That, that don't add up to me now. It doesn't work out, does yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. um, I agree with you guys. I mean, the, all year long, we've talked about the struggles that he's had, whether it was the identification of coverages mm -hmm. and, and identifying where the coverage is and then going to the correct concept or the correct route based upon what that defense presents to you. And all game long, San Francisco was running the most simplistic of defenses. They're running cover three, they're running cover two. Yes. And that's day one stuff, high school day one stuff. And unfortunately, Dak just wasn't seeing it and going to the correct, the correct route. Um, you know, you talk about the Michael Gallup interception. You know, that, that's, that's one play where I would actually say it was actually both of their fault. Right? Right. They actually threw the ball. Michael Gallup ran a bad route at the top of his stem. Okay, but if you look at the other side of the field, there's a guy by the name of T.Y. Hilton mm -hmm. who happened to be open the entire game. And it was pretty much where you could throw routes on air. And routes on air, for those that don't know, is sitting back there and you just throw and play and catch with your boy in the backyard. That's what was available to this Dallas offense the entire game, and unfortunately, he ended up forcing two bad turnovers. Let me ask you real quick, is it, is it because he's not seeing the defense, or were they confusing him? Because I feel like the looks, we saw it Simple in the pregame. We saw it. Yeah, I, I don't want to say that he's not seeing it, but I, I'm going to say what I said earlier in the year. Either he's seeing it, and he's saying, the heck with it, I have more confidence than, than yeah. in, in my guys, in my abilities, or... I'm seeing it, and I'm disregarding it. Either way, the end of their season. Yeah. It was the end of their season. It was also the end of the tenure for Kellen Moore as well, as he is now departed. And now with the Los Angeles Chargers, the Cowboys hiring Brian Schottenheimer as their new offensive coordinator. But it's expected that Mike McCarthy will call the plays. That's one of the changes for the future of this Cowboys organization. But when we come back, what does the rest of the future look like, including some young players that stepped up in 2022? The 2022 Dallas Cowboys year-end special presented by Miller Lite was brought to you by Dr. Pepper, the one you deserve, an official soft drink of the Dallas Cowboys, Ford F-Series, the best-selling truck in Texas, and by Miller Lite, the only beer of the Dallas Cowboys. It's Miller time. Welcome back into the final segment of Resilience. A look back at the 2022 Dallas Cowboys season. I'm Kyle Yeomans wrapping things up by taking a look ahead to the 2023 campaign and what the future could hold for the Dallas Cowboys. And with more on that, I send things back over to Haley Sutton. There were a lot of question marks surrounding the end of the season for the Cowboys between coordinators and free agents and of course the upcoming draft. There will be a lot of changes in the coming months for America's team, a process that's already underway. And that'll do it. The 49ers back to the championship game. Defeat in the divisional round once again at the hands of the San Francisco 49ers, leading to a disappointing 13 and 5 finish to the 2022 season. Yes, I said disappointing. Despite back-to-back double-digit seasons, a top-10 offense and defense, and one of the best draft classes in franchise history, Mike McCarthy and the Cowboys were disappointed. You know, we're 12 and 5 two years in a row. So, um, how are we going to move forward? Well, there's, there's going to be change. There's, there's going to be there's going to be adjustments, and and we got a whole lot of positives to emphasize. With the success we've had over the last two years. This is the logical step to build on it and use what uh, we've established, or if you will, the foundation of the wins we've got. This is a time for us to build on it, and that's what this is. This is a building step. You see, the reality is this is a team rich in history, a history until recently was marked with a whole lot of success. So getting back to the good old days, is the top priority. Yeah, I mean, it all sucks right now. It all sucks, don't get me wrong, but th there's no doubt when you, you talk to the guys in the locker room, you talk to the men that have, have put in this time, you know, the, the pillars of this team, uh, have to get some guys back, um, but there's no doubt that uh, that we'll be back, and that gives me confidence, gives, gives anybody in that locker room confidence, I hope. It's a process the Cowboys wasted no time in starting. Dallas announced they would not renew the contracts of six coaches following that loss to San Francisco. 
That prompted questions about the coordinator positions, with both Dan Quinn and Kellen Moore drawing interest as head coaching candidates. This was more about change that um, that we felt just needed, needed to happen. And while DQ decided to return to, quote, finish what he'd started, Moore made plans to head west. And McCarthy made his move back to calling plays. We all know the synergies there between him and Dak. I think it has worked and uh, worked well. This is an opportunity, though, for Mike and us to use other skill sets that we have. Dan Quinn gives us a great advantage here because uh, of his proven ability. And to me, uh, this is one of the best shapes that, in my experience, that I've been in in coaching. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are several guys that are free agents this offseason hoping to re-ink a deal back here in Dallas, including guys like Leighton Vander Esch and Tony Pollard. It's something we will continue to monitor as the offseason goes on. Here in the studio, once again, I'm Haley Sutton. Kyle, I'll send it back over to you. Thank you very much, Haley. And if you would like to keep up with everything that happens this offseason, you can go online to DallasCowboys.com. And all those offseason moves will be charted very nicely for you there. That's going to do it for us here on Resilience. A look back at the 2022 Cowboys campaign for our producer, Caden Gates, for Isaiah Stanback, Barry Church, Nate Newton, and Haley Sutton, and for our entire Dallas Cowboys crew. I'm Kyle Yeoman saying so long for the 2022 season. We'll see you again in 2023.